The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Now, uh, let's start uh, around 2000 before Christ, uh, but don't worry, we're going to move ahead swiftly. Um, the very first things that we could consider as sort of calculating aids, if you like, you'd like to think you know, of but computers before they, they were computers, um, is probably the abacus, um, the first known mechanical calculating aid that you can see um, there at the, at the top right. Um, anybody here used an abacus or seen one in use? Okay, a couple people. Um, it's quite amazing to see people see, use the system, but uh, my main point from an HCI point of view is here, there's something very strange about the abacus. Uh, what do you think is special about the abacus when you compare it to later things where you had levers to set you know, dials here with da Vinci's designs or Pascal's designs, and then some intricate mechanism would be computing stuff? What's different about the abacus when you think about the user interface? Yeah? The interface is very simple, but if you have no idea how it works, then you have no chance using this device. Okay, very good point. Uh, the interface is very simple. I would dare to say uh, that there is no interface. Uh, I would say the abacus puts everything that is mechanically there, that it does, all its complexity, technical complexity, is right in front of you. Like, there is no hidden mechanisms behind you know, those, those pearls on these rods. That's all there is. So you basically see the system itself. It doesn't require an abstraction of a user interface that you can work with because the system is technically so simple that you, know, you don't put an extra layer on it. Uh, but you're also right when you don't, if you don't know how to use it, then you're like, okay, it's pearls on a rod, so what do I do now? Right? Um, so in a way, the abacus has the advantage that there is no hidden layer. Right? There's nothing where you might misunderstand the way that this thing works because there is only one way to look at it. Um, but it also has the problem that it doesn't have a user interface. It would be nice, you know, an abacus and then there's a little box on top where you can set numbers like you know them and then the thing would do stuff with the, the pearls on the rods. Uh, but that's not how it works. So it's an interesting example because there is no separate layer of a user interface from the technical system. And today we encounter very few things that are like that anymore. You know, in my case, maybe a clothespin, right? Something extremely simple mechanically. You look at it and you see everything that there is to see. There is nothing going on inside that's hidden from you. Um, but most things, as soon as they include some advanced mechanics that are in a box or electronics or, you know, intelligence, whatever, IT, um, become very, very complex and you only see what we then call the user interface. And then the task of us as a you know, profession is to make that user interface so that people can use the underlying system without really having to understand it. So uh, da Vinci's calculator is where the mechanisms you know, be started becoming uh, complicated. This was the first design of a mechanical calculator um, that uh, sort of, you know, the, the, the brass user interface here at the front is where you set the numbers and then back in the, in the system it translates this mechanically. Um, it was actually so complex that as, as other things from da Vinci's time, uh, it was too complicated for, the, for the, uh, um, the craftsmen of the time to actually build. It took a couple hundred years until um, craftsmanship caught up with uh, da Vinci's ideas. Um, then Pascal's arithmetic machine from 1642 is the first sort of working model that could add and, and subtract. And um, get, you know, similar systems were built by Leibniz and, and Chicar. So uh, these are basically extensions of, of this thing, but they were actually put in, pr in, in practice as, as working devices. And they all started having a user interface in terms of dials and knobs at the front, and something was going on um, behind there. And um, in the way you could say the driving force behind the interfaces here was uh, you know, from a direct representation of the conceptual model. We could say like there is no interface basically. Um, we start seeing slowly a, an increasing level of abstraction being introduced through these interfaces, right? They abstract away from the technical complexity of the underlying system. Abacus, by the way, you know, just to throw this in, it literally means a sand table in, in, in Phoenician. Okay, so um, first computers. Now we're getting to stuff you know, with electricity. Um, a very early example of how um, computers would be working was that they actually didn't have program memory in the sense that you would store the program 
uh, digitally in, in, in some kind of memory array, uh, what you would do is basically you'd have plug boards instead. Um, so plug boards like you know, what you still hear from, from 1965, very late model, um, would al allow you to set hardwire, literally, the way that your program was going to work. So your programming was done by plugging in these cables. And then you would basically feed in the data and it would process the data according to the hardwire program that you had created. Um, talking about uh, interfaces here, you could say, well, those systems didn't really think about a user interface, of course. You could say even the programmer had an interface that was very literal, plugging in these wires. But on the other hand, there was a lot of abstraction, of course, going on between you, know, you plugging in a wire between A and B here and something you know, complex electrically. Uh, electronically that's going on in the back of the, of the device when it's, programmed the uh, when it's running or executing the algorithms. This picture is kind of funny. It's actually a, a contradiction if, if you know von Neumann and the architecture from von Neumann, which we're going to get to in a second. Um, he's standing in front of ENIAC here, uh, where ENIAC was still built in a pre-von Neumann architecture. And uh, he was basically you know, going to kill that architecture of, of plug boards and hardwiring. Uh, with his uh, design, which had the central innovation of uh, putting the program into memory. Right? So this is the design of computers that we still basically live by today, which is kind of amazing if you think about the fact that it was, you know, that they came out with it, what, like 70 years ago? Um, so the von Neumann architecture basically says, uh, okay, we have, you know, the central control unit, you've already seen this probably in technical computer science, uh, you've seen the arithmetic logic unit. This makes up the CPU. And then there is memory between these guys. Um, and interestingly, von Neumann already included in his basic architectural design uh, the, if you like, user interface of that computer you know, in the form of saying there are going to be input devices and there are going to be output devices. So these, if you like, are the representations of the user interface in the broadest sense in the von Neumann architecture. Um, very similar, by the way, to Tzu's design of, of the Z1 to Z4 uh, around the same time. And this architecture, of course, makes a lot of sense because uh, it basically meant that at the core was this, you know, this computing unit, which was very expensive. Um, CPU time was very expensive. Um, and if you look at the, uh, the I.O. devices here, we could call this user interface, but it was really mashing two things together. Because whether the output device here would be a, um, you know, a I don't know, a teletype system that would you know punch out stuff on a on a on a piece of paper for a human to look at, or whether it would be something that would store stuff on a uh, on a mass storage device, let's say I don't know, magnetic tape later, um, for for storage only readable by by the computer was basically put in the same box, right? So anything that left the computer to talk to the outside world, whether it was a human or, or a storage device or, or a communications uh, line, was all regarded as input-output. And that is actually still true if you open up you know, a, a you know, Linux terminal today. Right? If you look at it, the way that you send stuff to the user interface is the same way that you send stuff into a file. Right? It's all considered the same thing. OK. so. Um, but we do have the representation of input-output devices here as part of the overall design. And then, of course, we saw systems like you know, mainframes, batch processing, that would basically make sure that you make very good use of the computer because, wow, the computer was really expensive. Right? And human time, in comparison to computing time, was you know, jokingly cheap. So that meant that may, you made people do a lot of work to prepare the data in the best possible way for the computer to process as quickly as possible. So you weren't wasting a lot of computing cycles. Very different from today's use of you know, Angry Birds on your smartphone, by the way. Um, so how you would prepare the data was you know, put it on punch cards, and then you submit the data um, as is. You, know, you would walk your little stack of punch cards to the operator, put it down, hopefully not drop it, because then you're in for a good sorting task. Um, and then you would, you know, next day you'd come back and collect your results as a printout, maybe. Um, or maybe also punched on punch cards. Um, and on punch cards, both the program and the data is basically represented by those holes in there. Um, and this is, you know, if you want the main mode of interaction on mainframes throughout the 60s and, and into the 70s, um, very efficient use of the machine time, 
um, the machine didn't have to wait for human input. It didn't have to wait in, until you pressed the next letter, right? Once it was running the program, all the data was there. But that also means that um, there wasn't really any way to interact with the program. You know, basically, you gave it the data, and then it ran as what we call a batch job. So it did everything with the data pro given to it in one go. While the program was executing, there was no way to sort of interactively influence what was going on. So you know, no angry birds there. Um, and Nielsen, in, in an interesting book that is about um, usability engineering, very, very good book that um, Jacob Nielsen wrote there, um, calls these interfaces zero dimensional because he says the interaction happens at a single point in time. Right? Don't take the mathematical dimensionality too serious here. It's more like an, um, an, uh, an analogy. But interaction isn't continuous in this case. There's one point in time when you hand over your punch cards where the interaction happens. And then stuff happens. And after the processing of the data, there's another point in time where you get it back. So that's why he calls them zero dimensional. And as you can probably guess, we're going to get to more dimensions um, as we go along. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.